Hey fellow babies, welcome back to the Pactor Factor on Sifted.net. Apologies, but we allowed uh, Marcus Beer and Oid Gamer to sleep in this, this next month. Um, I hope we catch up with him at E3. I think we will. He's definitely coming to my party and he's definitely bringing guests, so that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> if you are a Sifted uh, patron on Patreon, we appreciate it. You're getting this pretty close to real time. If you're watching on YouTube, you're getting it a week late. Thank you for watching. Uh, the only price of admission is you have to follow at Sifted Games on Twitter and you have to follow at Michael Pactor. And I mean it, you have to follow me. You have no choice. From Sifted, our first question from Vox91. What do you think it would take for more third-party publishers to invest in single-player centric games. Why do you think Call of Duty Black Ops won't have a campaign? Is it smart considering how much free publicity Call of Duty's campaigns have driven in the past? Um, look, I, single player is the way all games were made you know, back in the 90s and before. Um, some studios do almost exclusively single player games, so obviously all the Nintendo games you know, I, I get that Smash Brothers can be, you know, player on player, and and Mario Kart can be, but you can play every Nintendo game single player. Uh, Bethesda, pretty famous for single player campaigns, um, they're committed to it. That's what they do. You know, my bias is that every great developer would prefer to do a single player game because they they can actually do everything that they want to do. Um, I think we're we're in the midst of a transition back to single player. You're getting story-driven games, so you're getting these, you know, God of War that are, you know, my my pick for game of the year this year. Obviously, we haven't seen Red Dead Redemption 2 yet, but Red Dead Redemption is going to be a single-player game. Uh, Elder Scrolls 6, which hasn't been announced yet, single-player game. Um, you know, so I think people like single-player, but the fact is that once multiplayer became a thing, the masses embraced it. And you know, I remember writing back in the early 2000s about why multiplayer was gonna fail, and I was wrong. And the reason I said it was, I thought at the time that people played video games to escape. And I thought, you know, people don't wanna get into a game and then have to deal with all the knuckleheads they deal with all day long. You know, you, you come home from work, you're just tired of the crap your boss threw on you, you're tired of your coworkers babbling on about this this week's episode of Friends back then. And you know, you just want to escape and you can get into this world where, you know, you are the god of war and you throw your axe and it comes back. And how cool is that? And so I really thought that was it. And of course, multiplayer starts in 2002 or 3, Halo, Call of Duty, you know, late, later Battlefield and great games. Um, and it surprised me that there's a whole generation of people that just vastly prefer to engage socially that way. I never saw texting coming. I never saw Snapchat coming. You know, I never saw people who are buried in their phone and it looks like they're just dweebs like we were when, when I was a kid, stuck in the garage playing video games. I see these kids doing that and I'm thinking, oh, they're not engaging. No, they're engaging nonstop. So I think the rise of the social media, the rise of texting, Snapchat, you know, Instagram, Facebook, that has led to people engaging electronically, digitally. Multiplayer games have become dominant. Um, Activision gave me a stat about three or four years ago that only 25% of the people who play Call of Duty play the single player campaign first, and 75% go right to multiplayer. And that's several years ago. I would bet it's higher now, it's probably 80%. And there are guys like me, like I like multiplayer, but I play the single player campaign because I'm trying to figure the game out. You know, and I get Call of Duty, we, we all know how to play that. But you know, if I pick up a brand new game, if I pick, and Wolfenstein's not multiplayer, but I like to just play Wolfenstein, freaking hard game. Like I like to figure out what I'm doing. I don't care if I die a hundred times in single player because I'm just trying to figure out what weapons are good or how to move or how to reload or how to you know, be stealthy or whatever you gotta do. Um, and I don't wanna learn that in a multiplayer setting and get killed every two seconds and let everybody down. So I'm the single player first guy. I think publishers know that a healthy 20% of the audience really values a single player experience. If Call of Duty doesn't have a single player campaign, it's because something had to give. So in the calculus of let's build a game, what are we gonna do? 
somehow the management at Activision, I'm sure, impressed upon the management at Treyarch, we have to deal with this Battle Royale problem. PUBG and Fortnite are drawing people away. Call of Duty players who love playing co-op, well, multiplayer, and playing against one another, getting on a team, are now migrating over to Fortnite because Last Man Standing is fun, you know, Battle Royale is fun, and playing PUBG, and we gotta fight back. So let's put a Battle Royale mode in. Well, if you remember, PUBG came out in March of 17, uh, Fortnite came out in September of 17. They both kind of crescendoed in popularity around Christmas, and then obviously Fortnite took off. Um, I think they probably went to Treyarch in December or January and said, you need to put Battle Royale mode in. And the Treyarch guys, Mark Lamia said, hey, I got two, two teams here. One's building single player, one's building multiplayer. I can't pull multiplayer guys off to work on Battle Royale. And Activision said, fine, pull some single player guys off. Now, I don't think that the rumor that we heard from Kotaku, from two extremely reputable guys, I think it was Chris Plant and Jason Schreier, um, I think they're right. I mean, those guys are connected. I'm sure they heard it from somebody in the company. And so, and they're not irresponsible. I, I shouldn't use a double negative. They're both responsible journalists. So I think they're probably right. But I don't think that this means single player is dead. I think it means single player got put on hold. The team building it got pushed over to build a battle royale mode. And when they're done with battle royale, they'll go back to single player. So my expectation is that the announcement, remember this is May 12th, so I haven't heard it yet, is gonna be Call of Duty will launch without single player. It will launch with battle royale and there will be a single player campaign offered later and we're gonna give it away for free. It'll be free DLC. If you want it and you own Call of Duty, you get single player campaign. So if you're a purchaser, you don't really care. I mean, I get that you'd rather play single player first, but you know you're gonna get it eventually and you might wait and buy Call of Duty in February when single player arrives, but that's still not letting anybody down. So, so my bias is, you know, that single player's here to stay. Um, PUBG and Fortnite kind of shifted the whole prioritization within the game development community because everybody wants a Battle Royale mode and you know, that'll be a part of my E3 predictions. But I'm convinced that you know that meme that we're seeing floating around the internet, Candy Crush Battle Royale, you know, Super Mario Odyssey Battle Royale, that's not as big a joke as it sounds. Um, I think you're gonna see a dozen Battle Royale games by early 2019. And so it's popular. People like it and the publishers are gonna chase what consumers are telling them they want. Battle Royale is what consumers want, and so Call of Duty very likely is gonna have it. So will Battlefield. Red Dead Redemption Online will have it. GTA Online will have it. Um, I don't think the Bethesda guys will fall for that. I don't think Elder Scrolls is gonna have Battle Royale. Or, you know, Rage, which is the big rumor, but you know, it's one of those games. Um, probably not, but I think the single player studios are gonna continue to do what they do well. The uh, multiplayer guys are going to shift to Battle Royale and put that front and center. And if that brings back some of these lapsed players that went to Fortnite, great. More importantly, it's going to attract some of the Fortnite audience who doesn't play multiplayer games. And, you know, I think there's about 50 million people playing Fortnite every day. I would bet fewer than 10 million of them have consoles. And so the 40 million who don't, let's get those guys to buy consoles and play Call of Duty. That's the goal. So I think single player is important for the core. Uh, multiplayer is important for the masses. Battle Royale is the flavor of the month. And so something had to give. I think single player suffers for a bit, comes back, and we're fine. Our next question from Patreon from Brandon DeGroot. Dear Pack, in light of the Walmart Canada leak, those bastards in Canada, um, we need more law. You know, I think we need like less gun control in Canada. We need to kill the people at Walmart who leak who leak E3 stuff. That's just not fair. I am kidding. I'm not advocating violence. It was a joke. But those Canadians, you know, they ruin E3 for us. Um, in, in light of the Walmart Canada leak of multiple alleged upcoming games, what controls are in place to ensure retailers do not leak information? Boy, that's a great question too. Do publishers make retailers sign some type of NDA? What are the consequences of mistakes like this? Um, yes, they do. And unfortunately, the consequences are that the publisher can sanction the retailer by withholding uh, what they call cooperative marketing dollars. And they can obviously sanction the retailer by not providing copies of the games or restricting their supply. But I, I, I'm gonna give you guys like a little advice for the rest of your life. 
Um, if you're ever a seller of anything and you know, a retail product, don't fuck with Walmart. Sorry. Um, so that's the problem. If it was, you know, Joe's Game Store, you know, one game store in Canada, they would say, no way, you're getting nothing. Um, I remember back when the um, Wii launched, uh, Amazon, day one, was discounting the Wii, and I think the Wii was two ninety, two forty nine at launch. So it's two forty nine. I think Amazon had it for like two twenty nine, and it it the the very same day that they put it out for two twenty nine, it goes um, available in four weeks. You know, and it was already out, and that available in four weeks stayed there for like three months. Nintendo said, you know what, Amazon screw you you're discounting our brand new product no you're getting none so props to Nintendo because they're not afraid of Amazon um, st still I think some guys do actually mess with Amazon but Walmart really hard Walmart and GameStop really hard now the good news is Walmart genuinely likes you know the games business they genuinely want to support publishers this was some fool at Walmart Canada who was just testing the design of the web page. And if you look at those games, I mean, I actually do believe it's real, but if you look at the games that were listed, they were all black, black face on the game uh, cover with just white normal type print. So I, I saw uh, one of the games was Rage 2 and the Rage Twitter site posted like all this pink art, you know, showing what was wrong. It's like, Rage is all caps, you idiot. You know, it's not upper and lower case. It was really funny. So NDAs aside, genuine mistakes get made. Walmart Canada made a genuine mistake. Uh, from Patreon, we have a question from Delta Prime. Hey, Pac, if enough countries ban loot crates that the practice becomes untenable, what do you think publishers will do in order to keep their games as profitable as possible? If loot boxes are banned, there's plenty of ways to charge you. So this, like, make all the items in the loot box, you know, available at the store for their value. So let's pretend that that EA, I'm just going to make this up. EA's got card packs in FIFA Ultimate Team and you can get a messy card. One out of every 500 card packs has messy cards. And that's, that's, so that's their goal. So they're going to sell 500 card packs. And again, I'm just making up numbers at $2.50 a piece. So they're going to collect $1,250. And every $1,250, there's a messy card sold. You know what? charge a thousand for the messy card they aren't going to lose very much players will be crazy but they can do it and if that's what it takes that's what's going to happen and we can argue about whether fifa is going to be more fun or not um i get the whole pay to win thing but guess what messi who is arguably the best player in soccer isn't that much better than the next five guys and you can price those guys at 300 and 125 and you can make some really good players 25 and everybody's got them and you can defeat Messi. Um, so they'll come up with a way to do it. The country's banning loot boxes. Um, the argument that loot boxes are gambling and obviously every country is entitled to have its own law. I'm sure there is a country out there who will pass a law and it, it will say gambling or not who gives a shit loot boxes are illegal. They can do that. They can 100% do that. But right now the laws don't say that. Right now the laws say gambling is illegal and they're using an existing law that says gambling is illegal to apply it to loot boxes. It's the application that's wrong. So again, any country that has the guts to say we don't like loot boxes and our, our legislature is gonna ban them, fine. Then watch what the players do. Players will go ape shit and say, what are you regulating video games for? If you say loot boxes are gambling, then you have to say baseball cards that come with a stick of gum are gambling. You have to say that, that I forgot the name, but LOL something dolls that 69 bucks, I just, I tweeted about this last week, where the box has a big question mark on it and inside you don't know what dolls you're getting, that's gambling. And the argument, that, and that, none of them are, just so you know. Um, the argument that these are gambling is saying that you're getting something, you're spending money for a chance to, to win something, win something of tangible value. And the question is, what's the tangible value of a digital character in FIFA Ultimate Team? Answer, zero, unless you can sell that guy for money. And I get in Ultimate Team, you can exchange players for in-game currency, 
but you can win in-game currency lots of other ways too. You don't, you're not required to buy in-game currency. So the in-game currency has value only because it buys other digital characters. You can't sell them under the terms of the game for real currency. Yes, I know Counter-Strike Go has a store and you can. Counter-Strike Go's got a problem. So the way to get around the gambling regulations is kill the Counter-Strike Go store. Kill any store where you can sell something outside the game. Ban players who do it. Obviously there's ways to do it like, hey on eBay or, or Craigslist or whatever. I've got this, you know, level 50 character or level 120 character in World of Warcraft and, and if you pay me a thousand bucks, I'll drop my character and you, I'll give you my password and you can be my character. You just ban those guys. So when you see that, that character is now banned from, from World of Warcraft. There's ways to do it and I actually think it will take a legislature with guts to pass a law that says loot boxes are gambling. And I frankly think even if they do that, if they... If they say loot boxes are gambling, they're gonna lose in court. If they say loot boxes are banned because we don't like them, which you're allowed to do, right? You can ban cigarette smoking inside public buildings because you don't like cigarette smoke. There's no law that says that you have to prove why. You just say, we, you can't do it, period. So the uh, robot cash plan where you can trade in your digital game copies and the publishers participate and everybody gets a cut, Yes, that, that means your digital collection has value, obviously. And that's going to have to be addressed. I, I, look, I personally think loot boxes are just a stupid idea. They were a bad idea when they started. Um, I'm fine with them if everything in them is cosmetic, then for sure we don't care. So let's be real. Like, like the, you know, the, the packs you buy, and I'll, let's use Game Pass in, uh, in, in Fortnite. Um, Game Pass is like a 10 week pass. You earn currency in the game, you know, for accomplishing objectives. You unlock skins. I don't think at the beginning you know what the skins are gonna be. So arguably for $10, you have a 10 week experience. You're gonna get three skins, three jet packs, three backpacks, uh, three axes, you know, three of, like, they give you a ton of stuff. But you don't know when you start what you're gonna get. What you know is if you do everything, you earn $10 of currency and you can buy the next game pass. I think that's really smart, but it's cosmetic. I mean, the, the, your ax having you know carrots on the end because it's Easter doesn't make it kill any better. And your bunny suit that you win doesn't make you a better player. So that kind of stuff, I, you know, I just cannot in a million years see anybody outlawing that because you're getting something that has for sure no value. It's, it's what's, you know, there's something called intrinsic value where it's clear it's worth something. Then there's these, this collectible value that it's hard to get, so you want it. So Messi has value because he's a better player than some of the other players, but the bunny suit doesn't. And, and you might say, well, but only one out of a thousand people has a bunny suit. That's just because you're a nerd. It doesn't have intrinsic value. So I think you can absolutely defeat the gambling rules. And one last lecture on gambling. The, the common law definition of gambling is you wager money in, in, the, in exchange for a chance, so chance meaning you don't know the outcome, to win something of monetary value, period. So you buy a lottery ticket and you might win the lottery, you might win millions of dollars. That's gambling. And lotteries are exempted by state by state but you know they have the states have to say this is a legal gambling. Um, remember, I said chance. So a game that's not chance, like skill-based games, not gambling. So there's a company called Skills, S K I L L Z dot com. Check it out on your phone. You can wager against another player, and you can say I'm better at you know bowling than you are on the phone. And if you beat them at the bowling game, you each wager a dollar, you get a dollar sixty or a dollar eighty, and skills takes a, a cut for arranging the match. That's not gambling. Our last question this week from Patreon from Carl Kuras. Given EA's somewhat questionable success using the Star Wars license and lack of big AAA Marvel or Disney games on the market right now, how likely is that Disney may try to restart its internal game development arm again? And if not, do you think a blanket license for all its IP makes sense? Yeah, that's a really, another, boy, these good questions this week. Yeah, great question. Um, Disney sucks. 
at video games. And when I say that, I'm saying that advisedly because Disney has had pockets of brilliance in their game development. Um, they had Warren Spector working for them on Epic Mickey. Please go find that game and buy it and play it. It is so fun. Um, it's a Wii game, so you probably you got to find a Wii if you don't have one anymore. Second one was released for everything. Yeah, it's the first one was amazing. I didn't play the second, but I'm sure it was great too. First one was amazing. Uh, what a, Warren is an amazing game maker. Um, then their next giant success was Disney Infinity. I have to say, you know, you, you I don't know what you think of Toys to Life and Skylanders and stuff. Disney Infinity is special. And Disney, the reason I say Disney sucks at video games, they've made at least two franchises that were giant and great in Epic Mickey and in uh, Infinity. And that was Johnny Vignocchi. And they um, blew it both times. They, not the developers, the, the corporation, by spending way too much money on marketing, on staffing. They had way too many people working on everything. And so Disney Infinity did something like $750 million of, of revenue and wasn't profitable. That's just freaking crazy. There's something wrong with Disney. So before that, um, they failed a couple of times and they shut down their games division. They shut down their games division this time uh, after Infinity. Pixar had a deal with THQ, may they rest in peace. And Pixar squeezed THQ each iteration of a Pixar movie for more and more and more you know, of the revenues of the game. So I think they started at probably 10% or 12.5%. They got up to 15 and 17 and 20. And when the license fee got up to 20%, THQ couldn't make any money. Now, as it happened, um, the games Finding Nemo and Cars, so these are mid-2000s, I think Finding Nemo is probably 2004 or five, and Cars was like six or seven. Both phenomenal successes for THQ. And the stock worked and the company was thriving. And then the few after that, Up, uh, Wally, -E. God, I'm trying to remember all these games. But anyway, they flopped. And they flopped because the license fee went up. And so, you know, out of 100% of the revenue, if you have a 10% royalty, you can afford to spend maybe 20% on R&D, you know, on development of the game. If your royalty goes up to 20%, you can only afford to spend 10% on R&D to make the same money, which means the games were worse. So, you know, no knock on THQ. Disney was greedy. They wanted more money. Something had to give for the, out, the outsourced publisher to be able to make money, and they skipped on development. And so the up game didn't work. Wally -E didn't work. There was one more that was terrible. Anyway, and THQ relinquished the license. So Disney took it in-house. Do any of you remember the Frozen game? Uh, my guess is you didn't. How about Coco? Uh, my guess is you did. How about Inside Out? My guess is you didn't. So how is it that Disney is in a better place if there used to be games like Cars and Finding Nemo made by a really great partner in THQ, and now you have all these movies and there's no game? So that's the problem. It's better for the movie studio to have somebody make a game because it supports the launch of the movie. And I think Disney has been exceptionally stupid about this. So the answer to your question is, if Disney is smart, they will license everything to one publisher. Um, I think you're right that, that EA's had questionable success with Star Wars, it's been up and down. The first game did well, but was not a good game. The second game did poorly and was not a good game. So I think it's really important for Disney, if they choose EA as a partner, to insist on some kind of quality standards. And honestly, EA is talented. They can make good games. I think Disney would be super smart to say to EA, look, we want, um, we want you to make Star Wars games. We want you to make Indiana Jones games. We want you to make Marvel games. We want you to make uh, Pixar games. And we'll cut the royalty to 7.5% because we want these games made and we want them to be good because they sell more toys. They sell more theme park visits. I think it's super smart. Um, I actually think Disney's going to get its act together and do that. Will it be EA? I don't know. I mean, had EA made 90 rated Star Wars games, yes. Um, good news, I think, is that Vince Zampella's respawn, you know, with Stig Asmussen making the game, is making the next Star Wars game after, after uh, this past one. Um, they're making the one, I think, that's coming out in 2019. If, if not, it's at latest 2020. That game, Stig is good. 
and Vince is really good. And my guess is the Respawn game solidly, you know, mid 80s, which is good enough for a licensed property. Um, so I think they're gonna get the Star Wars juju back. Okay, fellow babies, thank you for joining us on Packer Factor. Apologies for wearing this green shirt for the next four weeks. Um, look, if you're watching on sifted.net and you're a Patreon patron, thank you so much. Uh, Shane's gotta keep this stuff going. Um, if you're not watching on Patreon or on sifted.net, you're watching on YouTube, please follow at Sifted Games, at Michael Pactor, and if enough of you follow at Annoyed Gamer, we'll probably get Marcus back on as a regular guest host. I'd love to see Marcus launch a show on, on this network. And frankly, I think we need to start hounding at Adam Sessler, because he's a big pussy. We need to get him to get on the show too, and I think, I think he will do it. Um, He's been running around in his little Japanese eggplant outfit and he's like showing scary pictures of himself and, and realizing how old he is. I think he needs to be back in front of the camera and have fun. So hassle at Adam Sessler, please, and get him on my show. He'll come. Uh, hope you guys have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.